today I want to talk about how to be a contagious Christian, okay? That's really going to be our, our series for the next, for the next, uh, next m- four weeks, okay? Let me tell you two reasons why we don't share the good news of Jesus, and then let me tell you two reasons why we do, okay? Why we should, okay? And the number one reason why we don't is because we're okay, okay? I got it right there. And uh, it's, you notice the word un- okay is underlined. It is underlined because that is one of the fill in the blanks. I believe that's the answer to number one. See, God saved us. He got rid of, we had a messed up life. We came to Jesus. He changed our life. He started blessing our work, our family, our finances. And after a while of being a Christian, life is good. Am I right? But the problem is life becomes so good, we, all our prayers begin to focus around us and no one else. Lord, bless me, my wife, my two kids, us four no more. We get content to live with that blessing. In the Bible, there's a great story that illustrates that. Let's see if I can get to it. It's uh, in 2 Kings chapter two, chapter 6. And there's this time where the, the northern kingdom of Israel is surrounded by the enemy. Notice, sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army, marched up and laid siege to Samaria. That was the capital of, of Israel at that time. There was a great famine in the city. They surrounded it. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. That is, a, that is a, a year's wage, a year's salary for a donkey's head, and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. That was three weeks' worth of work. They were so hungry they began to eat one another. That's how bad it was. Now let's look what happens here. Just click to the next one. There we go. So now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. Now, the, you know, in those days, if you were a leper, you weren't allowed in the city. So they, they always begged outside the gate. So inside they're starving, outside they're starving, and, they're surra- and there's an army just a mile down the road. And so they say, what are we going to do? Should we stay here until we die? If we go into the city, the famine is there and we'll die. If we stay here, we'll die too. How many of you ever felt like you were between a rock and a hard place? So they said, well, let's go over to the camp of the Arameans. The Aramean, the Aramean people, their capital was Damascus. These are actually what today, the today Syrians. Let's go over to the Syrians and let's surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we're going to die anyway. So at dusk, they got up. They went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. See, God was moving for God's people, and they didn't even know it. And they said, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up, they fled in the dust, they abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys. They left the camp as it was, and they ran for their lives. What a great thing God did. They ran for their lives, and the men who had leprosy, they reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate, they drank, they carried away silver, gold, and clothes, went off and hid them. Then they went, returned, they went to another tent, took some of the things in it, hid them also. Man, this was the lucky day for these four lepers. They went from famine to riches, from from, uh, poverty, like hitting the jackpot, the lottery in one day. There was literally enough food in that camp to feed and bless every person in the capital city of Samaria. But they decided to keep it for themselves. Is it possible that there are people in your life, at your job, or your neighbor, who are, have a miserable existence, and they don't know there's another way to live? Absolutely. I don't believe that there isn't anyone here that doesn't know one person that Jesus being inside them wouldn't help their life out. Am I right? That's right. So many times we're like these lepers. Man, we've got a good, why should I... I, I've got it good, so I'm just going to keep stay there. But you know what? Eventually, oh, they they said to each other, "Hey, we're not doing right. This is the day of." Let me go back there. <laughs> they said, "This is the day of good news, and we're keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace." So the question today is: Are you willing to tell the good news to the people in your life if you knew how to do it better? And so that leads me really to a second reason why we don't. And there it is again. There is a a direct demonic influence hindering us sharing the good news in our life. Paul said it like this. He talked about four demonic classes of demons that, that we struggle against. In Ephesians 6, 12, he says this. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against, these are classes of demons. Rulers, that's the word arche, like where we get archangels, but these are the, their counterpart, arch demons. Powers, world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. See, most of the demons that we deal with on this planet, although we cannot see them, we can feel them, they are what I would call radiators because they radiate one specific power or quality. And so that's the thing you really need to know. Spirits we can radiate who they are. Let me give you a great example of this. The Holy Spirit radiates joy, peace, goodness, patience, meek, am I right, self-control. When we worship God and our mind is focused on God, we sense the Holy Spirit, we sense that goodness, we sense that love, we sense that joy. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, because spirits radiate who they are. One of the reasons we worship God, we don't just come here to sing, we come to worship him because the Bible says he inhabits our worship. His presence gets stronger when we worship him and we begin to sense the joy, the peace, the goodness. That's the Holy Spirit because spirits radiate who they are. You know, many times in worship you feel lighter, you feel better, you can't put your finger on it, but it's because as you worship you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. So in the same way that God's presence radiates who he is, demons radiate who they are. In fact, most demons radiate one thing, such as fear, lust, hatred, suicide. In the list of demons that Paul lists, he talks to about two of them. There's, there it is. Oh. Powers and forces, they radiate one particular evil. They beam that evil feeling or that thought outward from themselves, broadcasting kind of like radio waves over a territory. Let me say this. Uh, powers... A power is a demonic spirit whose primary activity is to blanket a smaller area with energy of its particular evil. You know, guys, let me just give, give this illustration because we sense them, we, we, because, but we, because we're, not, we're not sensitive to what's happening, we, don't, we mis, mistake. You can go by a hundred beautiful women and not feel anything, but, then you, but you can pass a woman that has a, a spirit of lust and she may not even be good looking, but something in you makes yourself turn around and relook at her because that spirit radiates. I remember one time uh, talking about a spirit of fear. Um, you, many times with you, if you're with a person who has a particular demon, like for example suicide, you'll begin to sense the same thoughts of suicide that they're, they're, they're sensing because they radiate outward. One time I was, I was uh, uh, when I was 15, I was on a, we were on a bus tour with our church choir and I, I had two guys with me and I was telling them about Jesus and as I began to tell them, this fear came into this little room. We were in New Jersey, in this rural, rural town. We were out on a farm in New Jersey, three of us in this little, little room. And I'll never forget, I'm telling them about Jesus. And, and as I do this, this fear, we could just feel it enter in, just kind of like a fog. It was so bad, we started to shake. It was a spirit of fear, and it was so, so, so present, so palpable. They said, what is happening? I said... Guys, I don't know what this is, but I think it's a spirit of fear. And they said, what do we do? Well, we use the name of Jesus. And literally, I said, in the, and I didn't know what to do. I was 15. In the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of fear to go. And instantly, it's like someone turned on a light switch. It left instantly. And when the demon left, the presence of God came in. And, and, and God moved in their lives instantaneously. It was an amazing outpouring of power. But so spirits radiate one thing. And so the powers, they, they, at a smaller level, but on a, a national level, there are demons that radiate one quality. The Bible in Ephesians 6 calls them spiritual forces. Of, they, they, they radiate a force over a nation. Uh, and, um, you know, we saw this first when we, went to, when we went to the Soviet Union. There was a spirit that turned brother against brother. We, uh, we were working with an organization, and they had been training, 20 Americans been training they were going to uh, we were going to put the first bible school in the soviet union and we had 20 people they had trained with themselves they have trained among themselves for one year they were best friends when they got into the soviet union within one month they had broken into three different camps each camp trying to get rid of the other two i mean get him kicked out of the country why because there is a spirit over russia that radiates turning brother against brother 
And, and uh, so if you, if you, so it's interesting. Christians, we know there are certain things we work against, lust and things. And when we know what we're fighting against, we, we, can, we, can, uh, we can resist it. But moving from country to country, you will find that there are different dominating spirits that push you in a way that you're not used to. And that was what the hardest thing we had to do in Russia was try to keep unity because there was a spirit that just radiated among our, our, our group trying to turn us against one another. Ephesians 2.2, Paul said it like this, uh, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the power of the, the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I want you to catch this. There is a prince of the power of the air. That spirit now works in the, the sons of disobedience. Over nations and over cities, demonic spirits radiate thoughts and feelings citywide, in some cases nationwide. And they don't want to be displaced or cast out. We see this, the first time in the Bible we see this fight in the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel is praying for a change over his nation and the nation, the nation of Israel and also the nation of Babylon. And God sends angel, the angel Gabriel and it takes him over 21 days for him to get there. And then the, G Gabriel says to Daniel, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding, to humble yourselves before your God, your words were heard and I came. 21 days late, but I came 21 days ago. But the prince of the Persian kingdom, this is a demonic spirit, resisted me 21 days. We don't know, but there's another layer over our nation moving us one way or another. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia, the, the demonic king there. There are many, many scriptures I could get. I could literally go over scripture after scripture, example over example, but I want you to catch this. Demons radiate something, and there is, a radiate, there is something over our nation right now, and this is the one thing you need to know. And this is one of the things that's being radiated. Let me get back there. There's the thing that's being radiated today by the demonic forces is this thought that every religion is okay. There are multiple ways to heaven. Don't force your beliefs on someone. So when we want to tell someone about Jesus, this radiation, this thought hits us. Well, they're, they're okay. Everyone's okay. Everyone goes to heaven. It's, everyone's good. I'm good. You're good. I'm okay. You're okay. This is a demonic thought. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I'm telling you, one of the reasons why we don't tell people is because there is this thought. Every time I want to tell somebody this thought, well, they're okay. They're okay. They're going to be okay because everybody makes it to heaven. That's not true. This is a demonic lie. The Bible says in, um, in, in Corinthians 4, if our gospel is veiled, if, it, if it's hidden, it's hidden to those who are perishing. Why? The God of this age, the demonic spirit, the prince of the power of the air, has blinded their minds, the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. I believe that Satan is going one step further now. He's trying to blind us from our mission and calling in life. That it'll be okay. Oh, they don't need to believe in Jesus. They can just, they're just going to make it because they're good people. That's a lie. Satan is blinding us. There is, a, there is an urgency. There is an urgency. Sometimes we meet people that we never meet again on this planet because they don't make it through, past that year. There is an urgency in the spirit realm right now. And I'm telling you that the demonic spirits over our country, there, there's a couple of them. One is saying every religion is okay. doesn't matter what you believe. It's a lie. It's a lie. And every last person here in this room has that in the back of their head because they're radiating the same thought. And the second one, there is a spirit of fear trying to capture our nation. Where you have people <laughs> fighting over toilet paper. Fighting over toilet paper in our nation. Am I right? Every time God appears, every time an angel appears, God always says the same thing. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Let me give you two reasons why we should share the good news. Reason number one is this. Because God loves humanity and his heart is breaking for us. See, this is how I know if I'm close to God or not. The farther I get in my walk with God, the more callous and indifferent I am to humanity. 
When Jesus saw the crowds, the Bible says he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I love the parable uh, that, of the, the prodigal son, that when the son that left the father, and when the, this is a, a parable that shows us the heart of God for humanity. When that, when that lost child was so still a long way off, his father, God, saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. I'm telling you, if you're, if you're far from God today, God is not mad at you. Oh, no. God loves you. He's the one that runs to you. He's the one that's trying to help you. He's saying, come on back. Come on back. Jesus said it like this. How many of you know, how many of you know this scripture? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus said it like this in, in Luke 19. He said, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came here. He came to seek and save the lost. And I want to say this, reaching the people around us is not just Jesus' mission. He made it our mission as well. I'm going to say that again. Reaching the people around us that are lost is not just his mission, it's our mission. Our mission. You want me to prove it to you? John 20, 21 says this. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. If God sent Jesus to seek and save the lost, he sent us to seek and save those that are lost. Jesus commanded his children. His, Jesus commanded his disciples, go out into all the world. Share the good news with all creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 goes even further. Saying all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And gave us, see here it is, we've been reconciled to God. He's forgiven our sins, it's good with us. But even though that God has blessed us, he has blessed us so that we would be a blessing to someone else. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their sins against them. Amen. He's not counting, no, nothing you can do is going to stop God from loving you and saving you. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you. We beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So let's do a quick survey here. How many of you came to Christ because someone invited you or someone shared with you, the good news with you? Someone that you knew, that you came to Christ through someone you knew. Someone, someone invited you. I see a few hands there. Believe it or not, that, I see a lot more hands. That is the number one way people come to Christ. People come to Christ because someone says something to them. Someone talks to them. Paul says it so well in Romans 10, 14. He says this. He says, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Hello? What's stopping us? There is this demonic blanketing effect saying, no, don't share, don't tell them, don't tell them. I'm telling you, it's a demonic thing. Let me give you a second reason why we should share the good news with others in our life. And it's because we have the best chance of anybody on this planet of reaching our friends, coworkers, and neighbors. We have the best chance. Let me ask the million dollar question. If your life was changed by someone telling you about Jesus, and inviting you to church, why don't you do the same? If God changed your life, why don't you want to help someone else get changed? Let me give you all the reasons. One, well, I'm uncomfortable sharing my faith with someone else. Whoop, there we go. I'll go back there. I'm uncomfortable. Okay, you're uncomfortable. I got that. I don't know what to say or do. Or I'm not really good at talking to people. I'm shy and introverted. Got that. Well, I don't want to be that pushy person screaming through a megaphone. You know, we could come up with all kinds of excuses. For that matter, I could come up with a lot of excuses why I, I shouldn't cross the street, why I shouldn't go to a job interview. Am I right? But let me ask a better question. If God wants me to share my faith, how can I share my faith with all my issues and ambitions and hang-ups? And see, that's our goal. The one thing that we're going to do this week, the one thing I want you to do this week is get into a connect group where we will begin to see how, how everyone here it, with all your hang-ups, with all your issues, with all your problems, can actually easily and practically make a difference in someone else's life. Hello? Let me tell you a secret. Sharing our faith is a process. 
It takes time for people to understand God's message, to trust it, and act on it. So we don't rush people. We love people. 1 Corinthians 3 says it like this. Paul said this, my job was to plant seed. Paulus was called to water it. And any growth comes from God. So let me, let me tell you another secret. It's a process. It also means it's a group effort. Do you know to get someone into God's kingdom, it's a group effort? Do you know that God has been working on your neighbor long before you even thought about it? Because God loves your neighbor. God's working on your, co your, co your co-worker because God loves that person. He's been working on him. And, and you say, well, pastor, that guy is as hard as a rock. Do you know how to get someone a hard heart softer? Pray for them. Pray for God to soften their heart. Pray for God to open a door for you. Because eventually they're going to say, how come, you know, I, I remember this great story. And th th we have a great opportunity right now. The, the next per the person at your job may be freaking out, so afraid they're about to wet their pants from the coronavirus. And you're just whistling over there like nothing. They're saying, how come you're so happy? How can, how can, you, how can you live with the coronavirus? Because I have Jesus. Yeah, I, have, I, have, I want to share a secret with you. Jesus changed my life, and now I'm not afraid of anything. I remember one of the most outstanding testimonies I ever heard. Uh, there was this businessman, uh, El Salvadoran businessman. This was in the 80s, uh, so I'm a little old, but, but I can't forget this. He was, this is at the end of the guerrilla war uh, in, that's happening in Central America. And this businessman is on a plane uh, to El Salvador from Miami. And if you know anything about Central American Airlines, they, they make little hops in every country. So if you're going to Nicaragua, you stop in Belize, Guatemala, Honduras. Nic you know what I'm saying? So they, 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 were, uh, they went to Miami, and they were, they were, they're making their first hop in Belize. And, and they're about five minutes from landing, and the right engine catches on fire. And it was a spectacular fire. I want you to, and you know, when the, you know when the engine on the wing's on fire, how many of you know you're going to notice it? How many of you know that if you're on a plane and that's, your, that's one of your two shots to make it down and it's on fire and you think, my gosh, it might explode, the wing's going to, and everyone starts screaming and panicking. And this guy, his name was Christiani, it was his last name. He said, my God, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And the guy next to him is just, just so peaceful, just a smile on his face. He looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? How, and after the plane landed and there was, they, they landed successfully, he said, how come you weren't afraid when I thought I was going to die? He said, because I have Jesus inside me and I'm not afraid of anything. Do you know what that guy said? I want the same thing you do. And he led him to Jesus. And just a few months later, he was elected president of El Salvador and God used him to take the country out of guerrilla, the, that guerrilla war, civil war. I'm telling you, God has a plan for everybody. God has a plan for your coworker. This is a great time to not be afraid because God is going to make a distinction between us and everyone else. It's a process. It's a group effort. Look, after all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? These are great preachers. They're only God's servants. Through whom you believe the good news, each of us did the work the Lord gave us. Do you know God rarely uses one person to bring someone through that entire process to come to Christ? He often orchestrates people in that guy's life, uh, influences and experiences to move a person toward, toward himself. So a person coming to Christ, there's many links on the chain. You're just one of them. There are so many influences and so many conversations that precedes a person making a decision to come to Christ. Sometimes we're the first link, you know, the first time they've ever heard about having a relationship with Jesus. From time to time, we are the last link that we actually help lead them. But this year, leading someone to Christ is a team effort, and we are on the same team, and I want you to know I am your quarterback, and I'm going to help you, okay? We're going to do an amazing thing. We're going to make, we're going to create amazing opportunities this year at this place to bring people to Christ. Just like the Easter egg hunt. We're going to blitz the social media with our anti-coronavirus eggs. <laughs> and uh, Just kidding, they're going to be full of candy. But anyway. Uh, but, and we're going we're gonna to invite hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, to show up. And then we're going to tell them about Jesus. And you're going to tell your neighbors, your coworkers, hey, you guys got kids? Man, we're giving away 30 thousand eggs we're giving away nintendo switches bicycles we're giving away 150 stuffed toys together as a team teamwork we can be that link different links in the chain 
All you have to do is invite them and let the Holy Spirit and the rest of your team, people like me, people like the juggler we're getting in, help them get across that finish line to a new life in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so I need two things from you. If you look on your page, I want you to get into Connect Group. You can do it from your phone or you can walk about 100 feet outside that door and sign up. And we're going to have some of the best... Uh, Four, four, uh, four series, and we'll tell how anybody, even the most shy introvert, can make some sort of difference in someone's life. Isn't that why we're here anyway? Do you just want to live your life so that you can pick up seashells in Florida when you retire? Or do you want to make a difference along the way and that when you're gone, people are going to say, man, did they make a difference in my life? Father God, I thank you today that you have brought us to this momentous moment that we can make a difference in other people's lives. Spirit of God, I ask that you speak to people, Lord, that you move on their hearts so that they would, they would become part of the small group. But they, today, you begin to show the people in their life that would come to Christ this year if they just had a little nudge here or there, Lord God. Show us the people in our life and help us to make a difference this year in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I, I am far from God. I've got an emptiness in my life. The reason Jesus came was so that you could have everything that Jesus has, eternal life, joy, peace. You don't have to be afraid of anything today because Jesus wants to come inside you. The Bible says to as many as received him. To them he gave the power to be a child of God. How does that happen? Well, it happens when we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. Something amazing takes place inside. In fact, it's so amazing. The Bible says we are born again. And so we're going to give everyone that opportunity. You're here today. Maybe you've kind of backslid a little bit from the Lord. It's time to come back in. In fact, let's pray this prayer together out loud. Dear God, Dear God. I open my life to you. Jesus, come inside me. Be Lord of my life. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died for me. Now help me to live for you. Amen.